Well, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video, all math based of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here today, as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside as we jump into the chapter 4 review in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 1 textbook. This is writing linear equations. We've done everything from slope intercept form to point slope form, parallel and perpendicular lines. We did some stats based things, then doing some models, lines of best fit, and uh, arithmetic sequences. So everything involved writing equations, not so much graphing, although we used graphs to get things done. We did make lines of best fit with our graphs and we did graph some arithmetic sequences, but those were pretty quick. Uh, I'm gonna jump into this guy's questions one through 30. If you'd like to download this PDF down below in the description section, you can do so also with graph paper because we did do some things with graphs here and there. So just get them ready just in case and uh, with scatter plots as well and uh, get your graphing calculators out, especially when we hit sections four, four, I, I think four, five, we really did a lot more in the graphing calculator. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to have numbers uh, one through five hitting section four, one. In order to do this, let's look at what they have here. Write an equation of the line in slope intercept form, as that's what this was all about. They have these two points, zero, three, and three, five. Now, as I recall in section four, one, because we advanced later and figured more things out, but in section four, one, they only, they always gave you a y-intercept value. They didn't only give you like two values that weren't on the y-intercept in like case in point, you can see that right here and you'll see them in all the other problems. That helped lend to the fact that if slope intercept form was really the only form that you knew how to write equations in, that you could use it point blank. Now we learned point slope form in section four, two, we'll get to that. But in section four, one, given slope intercept form, three is your y-intercept. They're telling you right there because it crosses the y-axis at zero, three, y-intercept is three. Now, because they have a graph and whenever I have a graph, you see me do this before, I'm going to count the rise and run, but it's good that they're showing you an example of what the slope formula is. We can have it on the screen. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Distance is difference, change in Y over change in X. You rise two and you run three. Uh, that is slope of two thirds. So as far as slope intercept form goes, Y equals MX plus B. This is Y equals two thirds X plus three. That is their final answer. So we're going to go ahead and begin. Let's start with number one, write an equation in slope intercept form. They have the same idea of graph. I'm just going to point to this one right here. I hope that's okay. We have our run and our fall. Keep in mind the change in Y actually goes first and uh, the run goes second. But we're going to go down two from one to negative one, right? And as we run, we run one, two, three, four from zero to four. So our slope of this question, this is from zero, one, and four negative one. The slope is negative two over four. Now we do reduce our fractions. This is negative one half. The y intercept is the b value when x is zero, y is one. So this is our m value. This is our b value. Our equation will be y equals negative one half x plus one. That's it. And that's all we're done. Numbers two through five say write a function, write a linear function f with the given values. Therefore, we should still use y equals mx plus b form. I'm going to say f of x, though, instead of y, or at least I'll try and remember to do that. Now, what we did with these ones a little more so, and I'm surprised we have four of them, but I'll write what you could be presented with problems as well, which is exactly what I wrote in the first problem. What are these points? This is an x of zero and a y of eight. That's our input and output. And then over here, we have an X of four and a Y of 20. Now these aren't graphed, they're not graphed. So what we can do in these instances is use that slope formula calculation. The slope is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. If you're really savvy with this, I could ask you how much do you go from eight to 20 and you could tell me, and we're probably going to do that in some of the problems here. 20 minus eight is 12, four minus zero is four, 12 over four is three over one or three, excuse me, three. The Y intercept, the B value is, uh, eight is the value of y one x equals zero right there. So we have an equation here y equals or f of x equals three x plus eight. Three x plus eight. No graph that we're going to have drawn on that one. I'll leave it like that. Number three. And I'm going to keep doing the same thing as you see on there. I will copy down the original problem. I am going to transpose it into coordinate form. Because even for me, I, I look at this and it's not my favorite thing to look at. I'd rather see the X, Y and the X, Y, even though they mean the same thing, even though they're written in the exact order, this just, this helps me go a little bit better, right? So let's do the slope formula again here. Let's do a, uh, this time it's not a rise, it's a fall. 
we fall eight down eight and run two to the right so slope of negative four which means the graph does go down the b value is five based on what you see there and like i said these slope intercept form equations are going to give you the y intercept for these ones at least in this section to begin with when we hit the chapter test that might be a different story because remember everything's scattered everything's random and i don't remember what the quiz looked like when i picked and chosed pick picked and chose which which ones to do um but when they give you the y-intercept straight into slope intercept form other versions with point slope form different story we'll hit those when we get them uh number four this one's not the y-intercept no that's the point five negative one don't assume the first one's always the y-intercept this one's the y-intercept the value of y when x equals zero now this one's interesting and this is one that i want to really just talk about right maybe we don't have to show all the work here the y value is negative one for both of these. Now, the y intercept is negative one. I'm good with that, right? But how about that slope? The slope, it doesn't rise at all. It doesn't rise or fall. The change is zero for y. Although it runs, the slope is zero here. And a slope of zero means a horizontal line. One way we can write this equation, of course, is f of x equals zero x minus one. But that's not really simplified. The better equation is f of x equals just straight up negative one. 0 times x is 0x. This tells you that y is negative 1 no matter what x is. Remember, this does mean y equals negative 1. And although we're not graphing these equations, we did that back in chapter 3 uh, in standard form. y equals negative 1 would be a horizontal line across negative 1. Right? Slope of 0, y-intercept of negative 1. Number 5. Number 5. Uh, number 5 has more of the same. I don't really have much to say on this one here. But f of negative 4 equals 0 means there's a point negative 4 is 0. f of 0 equals 0 means there's a point that's 0, 0. This is the same thing, guys, as the last one. This is no change in y as x changes. This equation is y equals 0, f of x equals 0. Now, 0 is the y-intercept, but it's also the only y value that this thing ever hits. So that's why I'm just refraining from the 0x plus 0 kind of thing like that. I want to get straight into it there. Interesting that they had both those questions together in the review. I, I don't know. It works out. We did hit a positive slope. We hit a, we, we hit a fraction slope, all that kind of stuff. All right, section 4.2, writing equations in point slope form. So before hitting number 7 through 12, let's see what we got here. First of all, this is the equation of point slope form. I know it's a weird looking one, but we use it to its benefit. There's a lot of good things to it. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. Slope intercept form, you have the slope and the Y intercept. Point slope form, you have the slope and a point. Now the slope is still m from before. So this says in this one, write an equation in point slope form that of the line that passes through this point here. We can call this our x1, y1, and it has a slope of three. We call that our m. So three goes in for m straight up, and x1, y1, we subtract y minus negative eight, x minus negative one. You notice those turns into pluses. I've mentioned this before, so I'm not gonna live on it too long, but the signs change. The signs of these two things change in the appearance of the formula. That is the equation in point slope form. Now, number six. Oh, I didn't see there was number six right there. Number six, I was I would have skipped a problem. Write an equation in point slope form, the line that passes through four, seven, has a slope of negative one. That goes straight off of this example. So with this example here, again, or with this problem, I should say, we have a point of four, seven, and we have a slope of negative one. So for our, for our equation, it's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is a valid answer, although we've seen a lot of times if there's a one multiplied by something, even a negative one, we tend to not write it. So if you saw like an answer, like in an answer key, we'd say this. And this is point slope form, you're done. This is graphable the same way that anything else. Now, we didn't do graphs of point slope form in the previous chapter because the textbook didn't want to do that. But you can graph out of this if you can extract this is the point, this is the slope. You just start from that point of 4, 7, and you go down 1 over 1 like that, and then you graph it. It still works. Uh, but a lot of these other problems, they say go into slope intercept form. But we do it off of point slope form, right? That's how they build it. So here's our number 7. With 8 and 9, write an equation in slope intercept form of the line that passes through these points, and we start with point slope form. So for point slope form, you need a point, which we have two of them. You only need to use one of them. You're going to get the same equation regardless for slope intercept form. And you need the slope. Let's start with getting that slope. We need our slope. We need our rise over run, our y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we'll at least get this one in. 
6 minus negative 2 is 6 plus 2. So this is negative 4 over 8 or negative 1 half. Now, as far as our form goes, again, you can choose either set of points. I'm going to try and choose two positives if I have the luxury. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Could have I used these two? Absolutely. Now, they want slope-intercept form. So what's slope-intercept form? y equals mx plus b. We got to distribute this negative 1 half. That becomes a plus 3 here, by the way. And then you add 11 to both sides like so. You got to get the y by itself. You got to get uh, everything distributed, simplified, all that kind of stuff. So negative 1 half x plus 14, that ends up being our equation. I'm not using function notation for that one. Once again, if I substituted negative 2 for x and 15 for y, I still would have gotten this equation ultimately when I moved everything over. No change. I'm not likely to use both in any of these. I've done it enough, not only in that section, but I think I even did it on the quiz. At this point, it's kind of run and gun when I can and assuring you that it works. Try it for yourself. Uh, number eight, we have these two points here. Let's do that slope again. Um, I wanted to at some point do one of these mentally, but I think I think we don't want to make any mistakes, right? Now, I would prefer to keep my x as positive. So I'm going to do 7 minus 3 as my x2 minus x1. So I'm going to do negative 4 minus negative 1 right here. Negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. 7 minus 3 is 4. Weirder looking fraction, but we'll deal. We'll deal. Now, this does end up kind of lending to some issues on this one. So which set should I choose? I guess the smaller ones. So in this case, for y minus y1, I'm going to say y plus 1. Minus negative 1 is a plus 1. This is negative 3 fourths times x minus 3. And that's going to be minus here. Now, the problem with this distribution, and listen, there's no way around it. No way around it. Zero. Is you're going to have a fraction going on. y plus 1 is negative 3 fourths x. This is plus 9 fourths. And that's just a fraction. So I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. But keep in mind, subtracting 1 is also subtracting 4 fourths. I'm going straight into it with the common denominator. 1 is also 4 over 4, and 9 fourths minus 4 fourths is 5 fourths. So when I state there's no way around this, I mean when it comes to slope-intercept form. You have a fraction y-intercept. That's all you got to do, right? Just deal with it as it is. However, point-slope form is also a good valid answer if it was allowed to be written. So this one avoids fraction common denominator stuff. That's why point-slope form can be pretty nice, especially when it comes to graphing. Although that wasn't this problem here. Number 9. Let's see if we can get back to integers again. No idea. We have negative 8, negative 15, and 6, negative 6, 11. Now, I'm going to attempt this time as I find the slope to do this mentally. Some people can do this, others can't. If I ask, let's talk about run first. Let's go from negative 8 to negative 6. That's a run of 2. That's a very big fraction bar. Now, so let's go from negative 15 to 11. That means a rise. How much do you rise from negative 15 to positive 11? Think about it. From negative 15 to 0 is 15. From 0 to 11 is 11. 15 plus 11 is 26. So you have a rise of 26. I know that was mentally done. But sometimes you can go off the mental stuff. And I wanted to do it at least once. Oh, it looks like we could have done it with some of the other questions later. Maybe we will. All right, so there's our slope. Remember, point slope form is in use here to begin with. Um, I like to do more positives when I can, so let's do that second set. So y minus 11 equals our m value times x plus 6. Minus negative 6 is plus 6. Got to distribute the 13. This will be big, but it's not fractions. So 13x plus is that 98. I don't know what that is. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 98. 78. 65, 78. So we'll do 78. Add 11 to both sides. And we get y equals 13x plus 89. Double check that one for me. Try and plug the other set in. I think it should be good. All right. Numbers 10 through 12 says write a linear, fu linear function f with the given values. I guess that means do f of x. But for us, that also still means slope intercept form. So guys, still no change in what we're doing on this set of problems. Numbers 10 through 12. So you get a whole lot of practice on point slope form-esque stuff. Now, I have to think about whether, was it this set or was it? I think we started learning it in section 4.3. So I'm going to leave it until 4.3. We are, this, this is a section on point slope form. 
So we're going to use point slope form every which way we can. Keep in mind, this is the point 10, 5, and this is the point 2, negative 3, like so. Uh, if we were going to try and do a mental slope thing here, let's go from 2 to 10 with a run of 8, and from negative 3 to 5, negative 3 to 0 is 3, 0 to 5 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8. That's a slope of 8 over 8, which is 1. So I'm trying to go a little faster than that. So let's use 10 and 5 as our x1, y1. Let's use... Well, I'm going to use f of x. Here, I'll do that later. But y minus, if I remember, y minus uh, y1 equals m times x minus x1. If I add, well, listen, distributing 1 doesn't do anything there. It's just x minus 10. But if I add 5 to both sides, I get y equals x minus 5. Now, I'm going to write it in function notation. So f of x equals x minus 5. That is a function f given that information. So all of 7 through 12 are the same kind of question. You just get a lot of practice on it. And that's why I kind of want to get some speed up. Uh, number 11, I think I want to skirt by some of the point slope form stuff just because of the nature of the problem. And I hope that's okay. This says f of 3 equals negative 4, f of 5 equals negative 4. Whenever you have a chance of doing something with a problem, you make it as it is. This is a slope of 0. Once again, there's no change in that rise. I hope you can excuse me see it for what it is straight up. That means f of x equals negative 4. <clears throat> I'm not going to use point slope form in a problem that doesn't really necessitate it. Now, in keeping in mind how point slope form would work here, if I made this say my x1, y1, my slope is 0. So it would say like y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. 0 times anything is just 0, and I'd be subtracting the 4 over, and that's where this comes into play. So the slope is zero because there's no change in y as x changes and we move forward from that. Number 12 does have a change in y, so we're going to have to work off of that. We have f of 6 and f of 9. But of course, I'm going to do some mental gymnastics here. There's a point 0.68. There's a point 0.93. How much are we running from 6 to 9? We are running 3 on that. So for slope, it's over 3. Again, I try and keep my run positive. That's why I'm doing that first. And then we fall. We fall from 8 to 3. Therefore, we're falling 5. So negative 5 thirds slope. That might make you kind of timid when it comes to fraction. But since 6 and 9 can both divide by 3, either point should be fine. We should have integer values. So my formula will say y, um, well, neither are smaller technically. Let's use this set y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So this will be y minus 3 equals negative 5 thirds x. Negative times negative is a positive. Uh, 9 divided by 3 is 3 times 5 is 15. Add 3 to both sides there and you'll get 18. So function notation f of x equals negative 5 thirds x plus 18. Uh, not 18. Wait, yes, 18. But this is not a 13. This is a 3. Hello, plus 18 there. OK. All good on the point slope form. And quite a bit of uh, work there. Quite a bit of the same work there to do all those. All right. Section 4.3 is writing equations of parallel and perpendicular lines. I just wrote 43 because the 4.3. I should be writing a 13 here. But before I do that, let's take a look at the examples. now. Parallel lines have the same slope. They're distinct lines with the same slope. So if you write it in slope-intercept form, you're good to go. If you compare the slopes and you reduce the fractions and they're the same, same slope. Perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes. They say negative reciprocal, but opposite mean change the sign or negative. Change the sign of your um, number. Uh, reciprocal means flip your fraction. If your number's a three, then one third is the reciprocal, right? Uh, so those are perpendicular lines and let's see what they're gonna ask us here. The example says determine which of the lines, if any, are parallel or, or perpendicular. From here, if you're in slope intercept form, you can adequately identify the slopes for what they are. So they do rewrites. I'm going to skirt past the work, but they're solving for y. They get this y by itself here and this y by itself here in slope intercept form, and they make comparisons. y equals 2x plus 3, y equals negative 1 half x plus 5 halves, y equals 2x minus 1. Honestly, the y intercepts mean very little, unless. They show you have the same line. If I had 2x plus 3 here and 2x plus 3 here, they're technically the same line and technically not parallel, but that's not the case here. So otherwise, y-intercepts don't really matter for what we're doing unless they ask us to write the equation of the line, which they will. But this one here, 
slope of two slope of two for lines a and c those are parallel they are parallel because they have the same slope line b is a slope of negative one half negative one half is the opposite reciprocal as they said negative reciprocal of two because two is two over one flip it and change the sign it's negative one half therefore line b is perpendicular to both lines a and c and that's what they're saying here that's our example one. Let's move forward and see what we have here on numbers 13 and 14. Determine which of the lines, if any, are parallel or perpendicular. Explain. Now we have blue, red, green, and purple going on. If you can't see them very well, I will enlarge this graph. Graphic graph. Right there. Um, on visual alone, clearly D won't be parallel to any of blue, red, or green. But don't try and go by visuals. I'm sure they are drawn to scale. It's all about the numbers, though, please. Work off the numbers and show yourself what you're trying to find. Now, they do have letters A, B, C, and D. So let's find the slope of line A by finding... Now, because they're visually done with graphs, I can do rise over run like this. Rise over run. We're up to and over 6. <clears throat> so 2 over 6 is 1 -third. The slope of line B has a rise of 1 and a run of 4. So 1 over 4, not the same as 1 third, so not parallel. Obviously not perpendicular as well, but it might compare to some of the other ones. Line C from this point to this point has a, run, a rise of 2 and a run of also 6, which does reduce to 1 third. Parallel with A, we'll jump into that when we make our conclusions, and D it falls, it goes down one, two, three, four, something, 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 it falls down eight and it runs two. So negative eight over two. I know that gets visually uh, strange, but that's negative four. So here's what we got. A and C both have a slope of one third, therefore they are parallel. Now take a look at B and D. B is positive one over four. D is technically negative four over one. So those are opposite reciprocals. These are perpendicular. Yes, I could write this a lot better than I did, but here's what you could write or conclude. Sorry, this is perpendicular. Lines A and C are parallel. Lines B and D are perpendicular. Okay. They say explain. I'm going to say them out loud again. Same slope, opposite reciprocal slopes. Am I skirting past some of the mentionings? Yes. Am I sorry? No. <laughs> Listen, I've done this chapter for, for a while now. It's time. It's time that, whoa, it's time that we uh, understand what it is we're doing. Uh, no, I, I'm saying the things out loud there, and um, closed captioning takes care of it if you're listening to me on mute. <laughs> if you're watching this on mute, I guess you're not listening on mute. All right, let's do the same thing as before here. A is this one in blue. We're going down one and over four. And mind you, I'm not calculating these things here. Um, I am, I'm counting them. If they give me this this way, I'm going to use it this way, right? So my slope's negative one fourth. If they give me points, like on numbers fifteen and six, or on number fifteen, then I'll I'll do it differently. Uh, B, B is in red. We're going down one two and over. Looks like five. Wait, no, that's not right. We're going down two and over six. Down two and over six. So negative two over six is negative one third. Again, not the same as A. Um, slope of line C, C is here. This is from this zero, negative two up to two, four. So from negative two up to four is six from zero to two is two. So up six over two, uh, which is three. Mm, those look like they compare in a certain way. And D is going from this negative two, zero up to zero, six. So that is up six over two again. So six over two is three. Uh, so we have some connections here, right? This time I'm going to type them out just because of the way they're going to work out. A has no connection with anything. I'm going to state that straight up. C and D clearly are parallel because they have the same slope. Now, um, D, B is perpendicular with C and D. It has the opposite reciprocal slope of both of them, right? So line B is perpendicular to line C and D because it has an opposite reciprocal slope to them. You don't have to mention something that's not something. A is neither parallel nor perpendicular, but it need not be mentioned. So we'll leave it. 
All right, same thing. What should a parallel and perpendicular explain? This time, no graph, so we're going to have to come up with these on our own, but there are only three lines this time to compare. So on number 15, we have, let's talk about line A, where we have 0, 4, and 4, 3, and as long as I can do some pretty good mental math on these, I'm going to. So my slope for A is going to be a uh, run of 4, 0 to 4, and a rise of negative 1, so a fall of, you know, fall of 1. So negative 1 fourth. B goes from 0, 1 to 4, 0. Once again, you're running from 0 to 4, which is 4. But you're falling from 1 to 0, so that's a fall of 1 again, right? They're the same. Even though they didn't start from the same point, which is, I guess, important to stress, right? That they are distinct points, distinct uh, lines. They do have the same slope. C goes from 2, 0 to 4, 4. And again, I think that mentally this thing works out okay. We run from 2 to 4, which is run of 2. And then we uh, rise from 0 to 4. So 4 over 2 is 2. Uh, 2 over 1. 2 over 1 is not an opposite reciprocal of these. It's clearly not the same. So C has no relation to any of these things. But lines A and B are parallel. And that's it. C is just, a, just another line. Just another line. Um, number 16, 16 does not have points. It has equations. Now this was the same as the example that you saw above where they rewrote things in slope intercept form, which is really the way to go in slope intercept form. You have your slope revealed, uh, line a on this one is in standard form. Standard form does not reveal your slope. Two is not your slope. And remember you don't say two X, but two is not your slope just because the X is next to it. We have to get this Y term by itself completely. I start by subtracting two X from both sides. And then we divide both sides by negative seven, which is to say all terms divide by negative seven. So this makes my slope of this one positive two over seven, two sevenths X, and this is minus two. This is for line A. Keep this in mind when it comes to our slope. Slope of line A equals two sevenths. I think I should box this more than the other guy. But um, there's that. Let's just not box anything. Actually, let's box this one. Note where it is. Line B is actually already in slope intercept form. This says y equals seven halves x minus eight. So I just want to point this out right now. It's the reciprocal slope of a, but it's not the opposite reciprocal slope of a. Okay. So just keep that in mind because they do not have opposite signs. They're both positive. And that's important to know. Line C is also in standard form. So again, two is not necessarily the slope. Let's get y by itself. We subtract 2x from both sides, just like the previous problem. And these don't combine. I hope you noticed that last time. Negative 2x minus 21. We divide both sides by 7, positive 7. And a negative over positive becomes negative. We'll just write this as negative 2 sevenths x and minus 3. So the slope of line C is negative 2 sevenths. Time to compare. A and C are not the same. 2 sevenths and negative 2 sevenths. One's opposite the other. It doesn't make them perpendicular either, though. B and A, I said, are reciprocals of each other. Not opposite of each other, though. Not perpendicular. B and C, however, they are opposite reciprocal slopes. Therefore, these are perpendicular to each other. And that's the reason. Opposite reciprocal slopes. And you can see it plain as day um, for B and C, of course. They do have the flip fraction effect, and one's the other sign, uh, opposite sign of the other. Okay. Numbers 17 and 18 are a little bit different. They ask you to write the equation of the line that passes through a point and is parallel, and on 18, passes through a point and is perpendicular. This time, obviously, the y-intercept matters if you write it in slope-intercept form, which I will. And this is actually when they taught you how to write an equation in slope-intercept form without using point-slope form in the process. So we're going to go through 1, 5, parallel to y equals negative 4x plus 2. So let's start with this. Parallel to that means we need to extract this slope, and it's already in slope-intercept form. So the slope of that line is negative 4. m is negative 4. So our equation is going to look like y equals negative 4x plus b, right? Basically, we need to find our b. Basically, we need to find the b that makes this thing work. Now, before we were using point slope form. We would take this slope, 
we would take this x1, y1, and we, y minus y1 is n times x minus x1. And you could do that still. There's nothing wrong with it. But during this section is when you also learned that you could use slope-intercept form to do the same thing. Plug this in for x and y. 5 for y, boom. 5 equals negative 4 times 1 for x, boom. And find the b value that, that associates with this. Negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. Add 4 to both sides, you get a b value of 9. b is 9. So what that means is you have this slope, you have this y-intercept, you substitute them into that equation. Your equation can now say y equals negative 4x plus 9. Now, which do you prefer, this or the other? I, for the most part, actually probably prefer this one. At least that's how I grew up doing it. But point-slope form is a great way to just write equations, and it is a way to get into slope-intercept form. Let's go to number 18. This time we have to do something perpendicular to this line. So we're going to go through the point 2, negative 3, and perpendicular, I'll try perp, perpendicular to y equals negative 2x minus 3. Once again, a reminder that you do indeed have the y slope-intercept form right here. Therefore, your slope is negative 2 on this. But we need the perpendicular slope. That's my perpendicular symbol. It's like an upside down capital T. This is negative 2 over 1. That means positive 1 over 2 is our perpendicular slope. So for our equation, y equals mx plus b, we're looking at this guy. And again, we're using this x and this y here. Let's do the same thing as we did last time. There's nothing different on 18 from 17 with the exception of taking the opposite reciprocal slope. Everything else is the same. We just use this 1 half now. So negative 3 is uh, 1 half times 2 plus b. Half of 2 is 1. 1 plus b is negative 3. Subtract 1, you're going to get a b value of negative 4. Negative 4. So our equation will be y equals 1 half x minus 4. So could have I used the point slope form stuff? Of course. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is just showing the alternative method. 4, 2 was devoted to point slope form. We had six or so problems of that. I wanted to do at least two problems where we got them done this way. And that was the first half of the chapter. I know we had quiz stuff on that as well. So I mean, hey, if you knew it then, hopefully you still know it now. We can move forward. Let's start looking at the statistics stuff. This is scatter plots and lines of fit. We have an example. Um, I think it uses this graph. Let's see. The scatter plot show, yeah, shows the roasting times and hours in weights and pounds of seven turkeys. So how much they weigh. And I don't know if you can see this graph, but this is just for the example. So I'll kind of be quick with it. This is the weight of the turkey in pounds and how long it takes to roast it. Um... It says, tell whether the data shows a positive, negative, or no correlation. Um, the correlation is all about the link between as x increases, what happens with y. And there seems to be a trend, right? It, it follows a decent trend here. As x increases, so does y. The more the turkey weighs, the longer it will take to roast. And I, that naturally makes sense there. So um, as the turkey, as the weight of a turkey increases, the roasting time increases, that's called a positive correlation, as long as there is a correlation. And that's your example. All right, let's see. Numbers 19. Oh, they say use the scatter plot still. So uh, let me let me pop up. You'll have to give me a second here. I'm going to pop up the. Oh, my window thing's not responding. Give me one second. Let me pop up a high quality version of that if you can't see it well. OK, hopefully that works. Uh, something wasn't popping up for a sec, so I got it. So here's a higher quality version of that thing. It says, use the scatter plot in the example. Number 19 says, what is the roasting time for a 12 pound turkey? Now this is all contextual based. Use just 12 pound turkey, boom, 12 pounds. And we're looking for that. The roasting time is right there, four. That's hours. So 12 pounds means four, 4.0 hours. That's the answer. Pretty simple, right? That's what we had to do on this in this chapter or in this section, not always, but... Uh, what is the weight of a turkey that has a roasting time of 5.5 hours? Okay, so again, you're just comparing. This time, 5.5 is the y value. Boom, find that. <laughs> Match up the x value there. We're looking at a 20-pound turkey. So 5.5 hours. Excuse me, 20 pounds. My bodily mishaps. Uh, number 21. Write an equation that models the roasting time as a function of the weight of a turkey. Interpret the slope and y-intercept of the line of fit. So this is kind of us doing us things and it's interesting because i actually you know if you were an im3 you would learn of some sort of curve that works better maybe like a cube root function that's a better model because you can make some sort of 
better curve that goes through this instead of a line but we're going to find a line of fit draw our own version of some sort of line that says hey this looks like it goes through this best as possible maybe something close to that you need some points that are above some that are below you ideally would want to have as many above as you'd have below maybe something kind of close to like that i don't really know uh so something along those lines no pun intended and uh let me move it up just a little bit so it looks a little better uh the way i made up this line whether or not it's reasonable fair what have you and maybe it's not i'm sure i could come up with something better but it looks like it hits this point right here and this point right here and that's kind of good enough for what i'm trying to do with it right or not i i don't know um let me i feel like it's going too sharply upward hmm why don't i do this why don't i force it a little bit more over like that and get it into maybe that point there so we get some above some below like that that might be maybe looks a little more ideal to what we're doing i don't know if that's perfect or not but let's say that that does work better just to kind of get the idea and so this point is kind of on the line right if i kind of do this right this point is kind of on the line i'd, I'd say that might fit it better too i don't know for sure but you have some points above, some points below, one point that's on it. I kind of like that. So here's a point that is 12 comma 4. See, I'm not very good at that. Point is 12 comma 4. And I got a point up here that is 28 comma, I think that's 6.5. So I have a weird decimal thing regardless of what I do. But let's come up with the equation. So you still need the slope of this one. So my slope, I can do like a y2 minus y1 over an x2 minus x1. Now, are these numbers good? I have no idea. This will be 1 or 2.5 over 16. It's not great. If I use the calculator. Oh, hold on. My calculator does. Sometimes it, I have to reset it. Uh, 2.5 over 16. 0.1565 ain't great. I can use a fraction version as well, which is 5 over 32. I mean, you know, it is what it is when I work it out that way. So things happen. So my slope is 5 over 32. You know, did I like my other one more? Let me go back and see what the other one was like. Because if I have a weird fraction like that, I just don't like to deal with it personally. Um, here, here's what this other one was that I drew at the time. Let's see what this would have been. Just I'm going to humor myself here for a second and see which one I like more. Because if I can get a better looking fraction, I don't know what's a better line and what's not, guys. I'm just making things up as I go, right? So this one here would have 4, 2.5 and 24, 6 as two ideal points that it's crossing through. Let's see what this one would have been. A slope of 6 minus 2.5 over 24 minus 4. If this ends up being like better numbers, I'm going to use them. That's 3.5 over 20. That's 0.175. That's 7 over 40. Nothing is great with that. I'll just go ahead and stick with the first one. 5 over 32. Why not? All right. Listen, you do you, right? All right? All right. 5 over 32 or 0 0.15625. Anyway, let's come up with the line, right? We have point slope form that we can use by substituting values in. I got 12 comma 4 as a set. So I could say, uh, why? Where'd my pen thing go? There it is. Y minus Y1, 12 comma 4, right? 4 is my Y equals M times X minus X1 for 12. Now, distributing this won't make anything very clean. So, you know, everything I do will be kind of in a rounded format. So 5 over 32 times, oh, distribute, 5 over 32X. Because they want us to interpret the slope and y intercept. So we do need slope intercept form here. So 60 over 32. I'm going to write the decimals of this, guys. 60 over 32 is 1.875. 1.875. So if I add 4 to both sides here, this will be y equals. Okay, what was the decimal of this one? 0.15625x. I really should round this. Um plus 2.125 
Could I come up with better numbers? Absolutely. Here's more of an exact version of it. I'm going to probably round when I interpret the slope and y-intercept, but that's my equation. Here's the thing. This is a line of fit, maybe not best fit. That's what section 4-5 is all about. So sorry that I lingered on this problem for a little bit. Interpret the slope and y-intercept. Let's start with the slope. The slope is a rise of 0.15625 as we go over 1. The over 1 is over 1 pound of turkey. So I could say uh, you increase, increase the roasting time of the turkey 0 0.51625 hours. By the way, what is that in minutes? Multiply that number by 60. That's about... 9.375 minutes about 9 to 10 9 to 10 minutes about 9.4 minutes uh, about 9 10 minutes i'll say <laughs> um for every increase for every one pound increase of your turkey and that's your rise and run right that's i was gonna say turnkey that's what that is. That's the slope. The y-intercept is what is the y-value when x equals 0? 2.125. That states that a zero-pound turkey would take 2.125 hours of roasting, hours to roast. And this makes no sense because you can't roast a zero-pound turkey. Right? So a turkey can't be, it's, it's not that you can't roast a zero-pound turkey. Zero-pound turkey doesn't exist. <laughs> Uh, right. There's no there's, there's nothing to roast. There's nothing to roast, basically. So they, they do that a lot. I wish that they did a few less of them where the y-intercept <laughs> means nothing to us, but it doesn't there. And that's what I'm going to say on it. All right. That was section four, four. Let's go to section four, five on analyzing lines of fit. This other part of statistics. Um, the table shows the heights and inches and shoe sizes. Y of several students. So it's right here. I'll probably copy and paste that one as well. It actually looks like we might have to use it. So. Let's get that ready. Um, so there it is, kids. You got it. Um, use a graphing calculator to find an equation of the line of best fit, identify and interpret the correlation coefficient. Let me first see if I need to use this information for it. So make a scatter plot of residuals. Okay, use the data in the example. Approximately the height. Um, because they give us the equation that's written right here, I probably don't have to type them in. Well, it says make a scatter. Oh, that's the residuals. Is it a cause relation? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and use what they have and not use the graphing calculator. However, if you did use the graphing calculator for these things, what you would do here is you would go to stat and edit, and you would type the numbers in these lists, these for X and these for Y. And then when you do, you hit stat again and go to calc and a linear regression. And when you hit enter on that right there, it will bring you to what you see right here, this information. Now, I don't know if you can see it very well, so I'm going to copy and paste this over just so you can get a shot. But you get this information. You have to make sure you have something called diagnostic on so you can interpret the correlation coefficient, get the R squared value out of it and the R value, excuse me, but you'll get your A and your B. This says 0.498. You can see they rounded it up to 0.5. We'll use the estimated version. And they have 20, negative 23.48, whatever they rounded to negative 23.5. So we're going to use their numbers. We're going to use their numbers to estimate these values. Now, that's the equation of the line. They have the correlation coefficient of, like I said, 0.974 right there. That's strong. Any number that's close to negative 1 or positive 1 is a strong relationship. 0.974 is very strong. That's a strong positive correlation. That means there's a strong relationship as X increases, Y increases. As the height of a human increases, their shoe size increases. That's not necessarily a causal relationship, but that's the link in strength between those two things. And that's what they're stating. Okay, let's do our information. Numbers 22 to 24. Number 22 says make a scatter plot of the residuals. Now a residual takes this equation, and we do have one. So for 22, we got y equals 0.5x minus 23.5. Now residuals are substituting these values in for x and getting values out for y. Remember, these are actual numbers. This is a model for a regression line that predicts or estimates values based off the line of best fit, which is what was made. So I'm going to create something, and I forget if y hat is the actual symbol that we're supposed to use there, but I've been using it, so I'm going to keep using it. And residuals is the difference between your actual and your estimated, your predicted, your model values. So I have to substitute 0.5 
times these numbers, which is another way of saying dividing by two. And then we subtract 23.5. Now, I can use the calculator for this, and I think I'm going to. So here's what I'm gonna do, actually. I'm gonna go to the calculator, and I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to go to y equals, and I'm gonna type in our equation of 0.5x minus 23.5. And I'm going to ask for the values that we have here. I'm going to go to ask, and I'm going to substitute these values for x that we have. Don't mind me. I, we know what they are based on the stuff. So 64, 62, 70, 63, 72. And once I run out of room, I'll get these ones in 68 and 66. OK, so I'm going to write these values down. Don't mind me. I'm just going to get these values written. I'll show you what I wrote afterward. So I got 8.5, 7.5. Okay, so here's what I have so far, and I still have three more to do. But I have these ones written down. And I'm going to, to find the residuals, I'm going to do this number minus that one, this number minus that one, etc. And if it's positive, it's a positive residual. Like this one's 0 0.5, this one's negative 0 0.5. It's positive 0 0.5, this is 0. These are the ones I'm going to plot, by the way, the residuals. Uh, this is why we need them. 0 0.5 and negative 1 and negative 0 0.5. We got a few more to do by substituting those ones in. So let me go ahead and do those last few. Let's clear these ones out. And let's get 74. We already have a 68, so I can keep that and 59. All right, so 13.5 and 6. And my 68 that we had before was 10.5. But we compare it to that one, right? So 13.5 minus 13.5 is 0, 6.5 minus 6 is 0.5, and this one was negative 0.5. Okay, so when it comes to a uh, scatter plot graph of this thing, I'm going to use graph paper, graph axes. Um, I truly just need that first quadrant, though. Here's the thing. The scale's going to be kind of weird, right? Our scale on x's is like, well, it goes from 59 to, oh, this, this is going to be kind of awkward here. Um, goes from 59 to 74. And that's like 15. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to call, I'm going to call this 59 way over here. This, this is going to be kind of awkward. So I'm going to call this 60. I'm going to call this 60 and 65. 70 and 75. I hope you're okay with that. It's just kind of a weirder version of what we have. Now, as far as these, you can notice there are a lot of decimals and we might as well just spread these things out. So we can call this like 0.5. Does anything go beyond one? I don't think so, right? So let's do like 0 0.5 here and one here and negative 0 0.5 here and negative one. The most awkward graph that I've made, but it's something that I'm just gonna have to deal with. So um, Let's just go one thing at a time. Let's find 64 and the residual. So we're using this number and this number. So 64 is right here and 0 0.5. It goes right into there. Boom is that point. Maybe we should move the 0 0.5. I don't know. Let's put it in green. Boom. We got a point there. Um, now, these will look further apart, right? They're, they're going to look like they're more spread out. But remember, these are just one away at most. So it's actually not that spread out. But it's going to look it. I apologize on that. I just want to get some spread. Should I do that, or does that look too weird? That's OK. Um, 62 and negative 0 0.5 is there. Sorry, it's going to look spread. That's that's just the nature of it. I'm, I'm doing it. 70 and 0 0.5. You did enter my domain, and this is what I chose. 63 and 0. 72 and 0 0.5 this this does kind of weaken my argument though as far as like yeah these are really close to the line it's just because it's so spread out i'm just gonna make it what it is um what was that one 72 72 and 0 0.5 68 and negative one. Oh, that's so low isn't it um 66 and negative 0 0.5 74 and 0 68 again and negative 0 0.5 not a function <laughs> never was supposed to be and 59 and 0 0.5 so what we're doing with residuals again it would probably make more sense if we did bunch them closer together I, just, I chose not to for whatever strange reason but what we do have here 
this this looks like a good model for things we have as many points above as we have below four above four below two that are on the line right there and they're very close right there's no significant pattern that this thing makes not like a curve or anything like that verifying it's a good fit this is a good fit for all the wrong reasons of how i made the graph the graph still represents a good fit all right number 23 says use the data in the example to a approximate the height of a student whose shoe size is nine you'll notice uh, we have an actual shoe size size nine here a couple times but notice they have different heights the approximation is based off our model so shoe size of nine is our y value so we want to do y equals or nine equals in this case our equation 0.5x minus 23.5 and let's go ahead and solve for x here we'll add 23.5 to both sides and then we'll divide both sides by 0.5, which is another way of multiplying by 2. So maybe I can do this in my head here. And this equals 32.5. So if I divide by 0.5, that should be 32.5 times 2, which I think is 65. So we're going to get an x equals 65. That is a height in inches of the individual. I think it was inches. In inches. 65 inches. So we estimate, we interpolate that an individual of shoe size of nine is probably likely to be 65 inches tall and that's part a part b says predict the shoe size of a student whose height is 60 inches now we solve for y based off set off of that off of that 0 0.5 times 60 minus 23.5 and did we have 60 on here we did not so this is a true uh, and this is also an interpolation it's somewhere between our shoe sizes that we did have or our heights that we had i should say half of 60 is 30 minus 23.5 and this is um is that 6.5 6.5 shoe size I don't, I don't know how shoe sizes are unit wise so i'm just gonna say 6.5 now like me personally i'm what five hold on i never disabled my alarm from the other day from when i had this thing so i have to figure that out um sorry if it goes off again i might have accidentally put it on snooze uh sorry about that anyway what was i gonna say um my height, if I'm like 5'10", then I'm, I have so much trouble with this. I'm 70 inches, 70 inches tall. So and I'm, I'm either 12 or 12 and a half shoe size. So let's see how that would work. Uh, 70 inches tall. Mine's predicted to be 11 and a half. Okay, well, I outrank that by shoe size. Some mine are 12 and 12 and a half. My bowling shoe, actually my bowling shoe might be 11 and a half or 12. I can't remember. I think of my skating shoes and my cleats and stuff for baseball. All right, number 24, is there a causal relationship in the data in the example explained? Uh, I said no. My, I, I said that earlier, and I believe it's a no as far as one doesn't cause the other. There is a strong link. There's not necessarily a cause, right? Height does not determine shoe size. Now, I can see where you can make the argument, well, bigger people should have, yeah, but height doesn't determine it, right? There's just a strong link between them. It doesn't cause it. There are other things that are links between them genetically and things like that. So it's not height that's the cause. There's a link. Okay. Last section on 4.6 is on arithmetic sequences. Now, this was where we had this form. Let's see, they, they have the equation right here. I write it almost the same way. I often place the D in front of the N minus one, but it's still multiplication. Arithmetic sequence is a list of numbers like these ones that are separated by a common difference. You're adding or subtracting the same amount each time. Here it says write an equation for the nth term of this sequence. And the rule has this A sub one and this D in it. They're kind of like a, a slope, you know, this is all on writing linear equations. So it's all about this like slope and y-intercept kind of thing that we eventually do. But the common difference is what are you adding or subtracting between your numbers? In this case, negative two, that goes in for D, boom. The first term is negative three and that is inserted for A sub one, boom. And so we have an equation like that and they do some simplification, distribution and all that and they do it. Now that you have this, what's called an explicit rule, they never actually call it that. An explicit rule allows you to find the value of a term based on the term that you have. They said find the value of the 20th term. So instead of subtracting two over and over from one term, because this is the fourth term, fifth term is negative 11, sixth term is negative 13, seventh term, instead of doing minus two each time and writing a big list, you can actually substitute 20 into your equation right here for n, and you can actually find out that value. The same way we would do a slope intercept, like, like the shoe size thing. Plug in the height, get shoe size. It's the same 
concept. This is literally a y equals mx plus b without using x's and b's and stuff like that. So let's go into these. It says write the next three terms of the sequences here, 25, 26, 27. This is straight up using recursion, using the previous term to get the next term, but by identifying the common difference. So on number 25, you have 15, 4, negative 17, negative 18. They tell you it's arithmetic, therefore we can trust the fact that it has a common difference. From 15 to 4, we're subtracting 11. So you can trust these are also subtracting 11 here, which means we have to do minus 11 on these three. So if I do minus 11 on these sets here, we'll get the next three terms of the sequence, but it takes one to find the next. Negative 18 minus 11 is negative 29. Negative 29 minus 11 is negative 40. Negative 40 minus 11 is negative 51. And there you have those three. Number 26, we have writing the next three terms here, 2.1, 2.8, 3.5, 4.2. Although they're decimals, it doesn't change the fact that you're still seeking that common difference and going to work on it from there. Now, if you ever have trouble finding out what you're adding or subtracting, do literal subtraction to figure that out. A common difference, this is why they call it a difference. How far are these apart from each other? 2.8 minus 2.1 is 0 0.7. This minus this is 0 0.7 and 0 0.7. So we're adding 0 0.7 each time to these ones, and we get those values, and we'll keep them as decimals. So here we get 4.9, 5.6, and 6.3. Those are the next three terms on those. The writing's on the wall for me. I have about four minutes to get within the hour mark. I don't think I'm going to actually fit, fit it all, which is too bad. I wanted to give it a shot. Those darned uh, shoe size things got in the way. Number 27, I have 7 eighths, 5 fourths, 5 eighths, and 1 half. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what I did from the previous sets. If I could get common denominators now, you'll clearly tell what the common difference is. Multiply these by twos, you get 10 eighths here. And then, wait, excuse me. Yeah, you get 10 eighths there. Was that, that 5 fourths? It wasn't 5 fourths. It was 3 fourths. I apologize. Let's do that again. So multiply these by 2 on top and bottom there. And instead of 10 eighths, you get 6 eighths. There we go. 6 eighths. So I got 7 eighths first. And then it's 6 eighths. And then we have 5 eighths. And hey, if you multiply the top and bottom by 4, you get 4 eighths. So if you can tell, we're losing an eighth each time. Whether or not you knew common difference, you can tell that this is 3 eighths. 2 eighths and 1 eighth. Now don't leave this as 2 eighths, reduce it to 1 fourth and you're good to go. But that's one way that you could go about that set right there. Pretty nice and then you don't have to seek common difference in a different way. But that's that's literally how you work it out. Get a common denominator and get it that way. Don't try and go to decimals and calculator, things like that, work it that way. All right, numbers 20 to 30, we're going to do basically what they did in the example set. Find the equation for the term and then find the common difference. Now, if you notice, their equation for their term does require that we need the first term, excuse me, not find the common difference, find the 30th term. But we need to find the common difference in order to write the equation out. So here is the list. Our first term is 11 and our common difference is negative 1. That's what we're subtracting each time. So the value of the nth term, we take our first term and subtract our common difference n minus 1 times. I'm not going to get deep into the why of the matter. We did this a lot in the section itself. But I will state that we'll write a simplified version of this before we move forward. Although this is a valid answer to it. So negative 1 n and then plus 1 goes here. Negative 1 times n is negative n. 11 plus 1 is 12. So here's a, a simplified answer for this. And to find a sub 30, we now substitute 30 in for n. And negative 30 plus 12 is negative 18. This is the 30th term of the sequence without actually writing the list. Less than two minutes to go for the hour mark. As long as I start number 30 in time, then I can write these in uh, just the minutes version of timestamp. It's okay if I don't finish within the actual hour. Anyway, I get 6, 12, 18, and 24 here. We have a first term of 6 and also a common difference of 6, if you notice. So this is our a sub n is the first term plus the common difference n minus 1 times. I can distribute 6 into both of those, and we get 6 plus 6n minus 6. And we get 6s that cancel, which is cool. a sub n equals 6 times n. So we can find the value of the 30th term by doing 6 times 30. a sub 30 is 6 times 30, which is 180. Yes, there are 36s added together to become 180. There's the term. And number 30, we did actually start it on time with, with respect to timestamps, which is awesome. Can we finish in less than a minute? Probably not. 
Negative, well, I could, but I want to say things out loud. All right, first term, let's see. I still got to say that ought to do it for this one. Common difference is positive three. These are going toward positive, if you can tell. So a sub n is negative nine plus three times n minus one. If I distribute that and simplify, that's going to be three n minus 12. I'm going fast on this guy. Boom, that was this box here. And a sub 30 is three times 30 minus 12. 90 minus 12 is 78. And there is the 30th term. Did I finish in time? I think so. Guys, that'll do it for this one. This is Mr. Robinson. Thank you so much for watching this review. I wanted to finish within the hour I did. I hope I didn't speed things up too much at the very end of sequences, but we did a lot of practice at the time. Coming up next is Chapter 4, Test and Cumulative Assessment. Thank you so much. Take care. I'm going to see you in the next one. Hour done.